welcome back my fellow programmers and yeah we are back once again with daily leap code day let me change this day 58 of daily leap code we are back once again the trials and tribulations of the algorithmic battlegrounds uh exist concurrently with our mental trials just a lot of words to say that the algorithm the algorist grind is never ending right it's a mental battle and we're really battling these computers and we're battling the people at leapcode.com because they have written these problems to torment us uh i'm just joking but we're back once again this is day 58 we have some comments but yesterday's video yesterday's movie was called uh, yesterday's movie was called Skiena, Please Save Us. Because at this point, there's nothing we can do. Evaluate division is the hardest problem. It was written by Aristosthenes himself, the great Greek mathematician. Also, it was collaborated on uh, with Aristosthenes, right? Everyone who worked on uh, all of the space objects, all the objects we sent to space, as well as, yeah, it's just an impossible problem. And, uh, yeah, so, value division, we're still working on it. That being said, right, I've been reading yesterday, like I was saying, yesterday's video is called Scanna, Please Save Us, because at this point, the only thing that can save us is the algorithm design manual. So, yes, this is one of the great holy texts written by uh, the legendary algorist Scanna et al., Right, a lot of cheat codes in here. So many cheat codes, one could say it's almost as many cheat codes as what is available in the hyperbolic coding chamber, which is the Discord, supported by this channel. So one could say that the algorithm design manual almost provides as much value as the HCC. So you're gonna wanna join the Discord as soon as possible. Actually, we actually just had Skiana join the Discord last night. So, uh, you're all going to want to join because he's dropping some tips and cheat codes. So, yeah. But we got a message from the Control Copy Ninja. Praise the algorithm design manual. Actually, facts. Right? Praise the God himself. So, the book is pretty legendary. I've been reading through it. So, today we're actually going to do an hour. But I'm... We're kinda, we got, there's got to be a, some supplemental reading, right? So I was actually just reading the ADM just now, reading the, the uh, chapter on graphs, right? And I'm realizing the way I was going about this was good. I was learning a lot. But at the same time, uh, there's a lot of things I was intuiting that I actually didn't really notice I was intuiting. So now I'm realizing that there's some cheat codes in the ADM, right? And it's only going to expedite the process of algorithmic beatdowns. So... Yeah, praise the algorithm design manual. All jokes aside, this is a legendary resource. So you're going to want to cop ASAP, right? And there's also very, very legal and ethical methods to source this text in the HCC. So you're going to want to join for that as well. And we have some um, tweet coin chains intuitively. So yeah, Co Thomas commented on a video called Coin Change Beatdown. And I'm fairly certain the algorithm we wrote for Coin Change Beatdown. It's a backtracking algorithm that runs in exponential time with some minor optimizations to just barely pass time limit exceeded. But he writes to me, coin change is intuitively a BFS question, asking for the shortest path between the end state uh, goal and starting state. Use the same trick as Owen matrix, start from end state, work back towards start state. He mentions a very, very good point here because in coin change, that is kind of what we're searching for. We're searching for the shortest path and yeah, it's very interesting. There's also another problem called snakes and ladders, which is also another way you can reframe the problem to find the shortest path, right, between two, a start state and an end state. So yeah, Thomas, as usual, dropping legendary bombs. This man is a top five algorist as well with the control C ninja. So you're gonna wanna take these tips. And yeah, I'm, I'm itching to get back to coin change after finishing this chapter because there's definitely a need to optimize that problem, right? And I'm dying to fix it because it's a problem. That being said, reflections on the chapter. Yeah, it was a pretty good chapter, right? We're just talking about graphs. There's a lot of things 
like for example the distinction between a simple graph and a non-simple graph if I'm remembering correctly a simple graph has no self loops or multi edges which is important right so I'm noticing that right, there's a lot of and I think that there's a secret sauce to the book where uh, right you have these technical concepts about graphs right but how are they applied right you know you read a leak code question right how is what they're saying applying to what we're trying to do and so there are questions you can ask right so and I think that's the kind of the cool thing where like he adds some uh, cheat codes where you can figure out exactly what you're going for right so you might ask a benign question like if you're representing a social network like hey uh, for example given a graph right with vertices and edges representing a social network uh, you could ask someone uh, right if I'm if I'm friends with the copy ninja is the copy ninja friends with me and the secret question that is actually being asked there is is the graph undirected or undirected right because if the graph is directed then an edge between these two portions in the graph right uh, when we we're talking about that uh, undirectedness right so if there's if there is There we go sorry if there is me right and we have the cc the copy ninja right what the question is our i guess the, the cn right cn for the copy ninja and then we have t wong right the goat right and if you ask all right if i'm a friend with the copy ninja right is the copy ninja friends with me and what that's asking is if he's friends with me back Right, if I'm friends with him, then what that means is an undirected graph, right? Because uh, an edge between right me and CN implies an edge between CN and me, right? But if if that doesn't imply that, then we could have something like a directed graph where I'm friends with Thomas, right? But he's not friends back with me, which is actually true. Actually true. Feels bad, man. Now nah, I'm joking, but uh yeah that's another way to, to market right so that's pretty interesting and that's why i think is a lot of like the secret cheat codes in the book that's just i'm just regurgitating what i read but either way uh it's just cool stuff so i'm hoping right with enough reading we're going to conquer the remaining things we need to do but that being said additionally we also had uh yesterday right yesterday i said we were going to do an hour I think we got says we'll do an hour and a half, but yeah, it. I think we just need to balance the workload more. I think I read yesterday like a ridiculous number. It was like an hour, hour and a half, right? I'm doing the exercises too, so then I show up to program, and I'm like, dang, my brain is fried. So, gotta learn to choose the battles, and if I do enough reading, right, then I'm gonna have to do change how I do, uh, how much programming I do, and it also depends on other things like how you're doing in life and stuff like that. So it's tough, but it must be done. So I usually do an hour and a half, but I actually just spent the first 30 minutes reading instead. And so probably we're going to try to do an hour, but the minimum I always say, the minimum is 30 minutes always. Cause that's what we started with, right? So the minimum will always be 30 minutes. So we're going to try for an hour today, probably 30 minutes of review and then 30 minutes of evaluate the vision and then maybe off camera right also going to have to do uh i want to start getting into some system design just because there's some things i want to create so we got to learn to do some system design right and then we'll have infinite leverage right so that would be pretty cool but just to start right i'm going to start the hour clock right and don't forget to join the hcc this is a discord growing very very quickly we have just gotten control of 45 percent of the new of the us's networking infrastructure and we're in talks with uh, the state, right, and local counties, right, to make sure that we can uh, take the remaining control, right, and have it all routed to the HCC. There's just too many people in the Discord, right? So you're going to want to join a lot of cheat codes. So that being said, uh, another day, another chance to join the algorithmic battleground. So, yes, hopefully... In a few days, Skiana will be able to save us from this problem. That being said, 
there's some review to do as always. So let's just jump into it. <clears throat> All right, so we have longest substring without repeating characters, right? The last time I did this, I said try for an O of N solution with a character array. Current solution was N squared. So let's say we're gonna aim for a linear time solution this time, right? Our goal is O of N. We didn't really have a time complexity goal. So given a string S, find the length of the longest substring without repeating characters. Given a string S, find the length of the longest substring without repeating characters. Okay, so let's map this to our example. Right, we're given a string S, A, B, C, A, B, C, B, B, right? We wanna find the length of the longest substring without repeating characters. Right, seems that to be the longest substring without repeating characters is A, B, C. Right, we have another string, B, B, B. Right, we have the output is one, so we're turning a number. Right, the answer is B with the length of one. Right, we have P, W, W, K, E, W. Right, and so the longest substring without repeating characters is actually W, K, and E. The seek is a subsequence, right? The answer is WKE with the length of three. Notice that the answer must be a substring. PWKE is a subsequence, not a substring, right? We know that S can be an empty string, right? So we're gonna to wanna to handle that. And S consists of English letters, digits, symbols, and spaces, right? So we know just off the top, right? If S can be empty, right, if S is equal to Z, if S is length is zero, right, then we're gonna run a return zero, right? We have no string, the long, length of the longest substring is no string. So initially I'm definitely thinking sliding window, right? But how could we do this in linear time, right? We're given a string like this, A, B, C, right? A, B, C, A, B, C, B, B. If we were to do the sliding window pattern, we start at A, B, C. We start at A, right? And we know that there's no repeating characters somehow. Then we go to B, we know that there's no repeating characters somehow. Go to C, we know there's no repeating characters somehow. And then we go to A and know that there is repeating characters somehow. So I think what that means is that what we need to be able, since we only have, okay. So basically what we're saying is that we need to be able to keep track of the occurrences of our current window, right? So track occurrences of our current window, right? And then from there, that's gonna allow us to basically, we need a method to remove characters, right? Until we set the occurrence is back to the correct values, right? Because once we add A, B, C, and A, right? This A actually gives us an, uh, a repeating character. So we need a method to remove characters, right, from our window until balance is restored, right? And which means we have to keep going left until that is the case, right? So I think if that's the case, then what we can do is we can use sliding window, right? But we can control it using some sort of character, uh, some sort of uh, data structure that would allow us to basically constantly look up the occurrences of the window. So from the beginning, I'm thinking uh, a map, right? Where we can map the letter to occurrences what we can do is what if we iterate over the string, right? And we wanna keep track of our window, right? If this is gonna be fixed window, our right side is gonna be fixed, which means that as we are always going to be iterating towards the right hand side of the string, what's really going to change for our window is gonna be the left hand side. So we'll say left starts at zero, right? And I guess what we can say, right, is if for iterating over the string, right, we'll have start at A, right? If 
we do a sub right so we're also going to want like we said a right right which is also going to start at zero and increment right right so we want right is that right equals right we can say if right sub zero right in the map if the occurrence if the occurrence is zero right then we can add it right we can increment the occurrence in the map right so we have one which makes sense right then we'd go to the next one add b to the map we have occurrence of one then c and so i'll write this just to make it make sense i right, will have a goes to one then b goes to one right then we'll have c goes to one and then as soon as we get to a right we add a to the map right we have a a is now equal to two. So what we need to do is remove characters from our left hand side of the window until that has been rectified. So we're going to need some extra logic here, right? So we need that bit of logic that's going to add the uh, that little logic that's going to add it to the map, right? So what we'll say is update occurrences for car, right? And then we'll say is while occurrences for car greater than one, right, what we're going to want to do is pretty much shift that window up to the left. So I think we could actually draw it to visualize it here, right? So if we have, we're going to have A, B, C, A right to start right l is going to be l is going to be here right and r is also going to start at a but as we iterate through right our window is going to grow right where like we said on the first iteration we'll add a to the map right and so our window to start is actually going to be uh right here right a and then as we iterate through, right, we're going to keep going. We have, we add B, we add it to the map, right? So we can say that here, A is equal to one, B is equal to one, right? And then from here, we add C into the map, right? C is equal to one. And then as soon as we get to this A, we update it in the map. We update it in the map, right? Now this A, right, would change to two. Since this A is changing to two, right, we know that in terms of L and R, this eraser is so strange. Why don't they have like a regular eraser? Oh, they do. So we know that uh, A, B, C, right, we have all this in the map. Right, so then we know that L, right, is still here at this A, and R, right, is now here at this A. So what we can actually do is do an iteration between them, right, well, L starts at zero, and R actually starts at zero, one, two, three, three. And this while loop is gonna look something like while, uh, let's just say map, right, sub, r is greater than one right and map sub r is greater than one right because map sub r r is equal to a right it's great it's equal to two so it's greater than one right now what we're just going to do is just say uh map right sub l right minus equal one and if we do that right we'll decrement Right, because L is at A right now, we can decrement A in the map up here. So what we'll do is we'll just say, we can just cross out two here and we can just put one. Since we can put one, right, because L was under this A here, then what we can do, right, is, well, yeah, we'll change A equal to one, right? And then we go, when, when we go back to the top, right, of this while loop, right, we check if map sub R is greater than one, well, now it's equal to one, one is not greater than one, so we can stop. 
we have to make sure that we do L plus equal one. So I think with that intuition, we'll probably return to the problem, right? While the current is for car is greater than one, right? We can say decrement map sub left, right? And then we can do left plus equal one, right? And if, after we do that, right, we'll have in our, in our window, right, we'll have basically the longest substring, uh, the longest, or we basically have a substring right, with no repeating characters. And so to return that number that we're looking for, we're just gonna have a max, right? And we're just gonna return max because we know that's what we're going to aim for. On each iteration, we'll say max is equal to the math.max of max, right? And, uh, right, how do we calculate the length of our substring? Right, we could actually keep track of the window itself, but there's actually no point in doing that. If we go back to what we had earlier, right, we know that R, right, after we run this, uh, after we run this bit down here once, right, after we run this bit down here once, we know that uh, L, right, is going to change to one, right, because the substring represented here, right, that now has no repeating characters is actually going to put L right where B is, right? So we know that L is equal to one and R is equal to three. So what's the length of our substring? We know our length of our substring is three, right? Because it's B, C, A right here. So if we have L and R, we know that if we do R, right, minus L, we get two, we add one, right? We get three. So I think to get the length of our substring, we're just going to have to do right minus left plus one, right? So to do that, we'll just say right minus left plus one. And since we're gonna be taking the longest subject, we're gonna do max, right? So we'll set max equal to negative infinity to start. And I think we have enough to actually jump into an implementation, right? We actually don't need to declare right because it's gonna be part of our for loop, so I think what we can do is just say, let right is equal to zero, right is less than s dot length, right plus plus. Afterwards, right, we can drop that curly brace. And like you said, we wanna update the occurrences for character. To do that, we're gonna need that map that we mentioned earlier, which is gonna map strings to characters. I mean, strings to the occurrences, which is gonna mean we're gonna map a string to a number. So we'll start that off here want to update the occurrences for the character, right? And to do that, all you have to do is say, if the map, right, has an entry for, we'll just say the car is equal to, uh, right, I mean, S sub right, right? So if the map has an entry for this character, right, what we want to do is add to it, we'll just say uh, map.set, right, character equal to the occurrence, right, we're gonna get the occurrences for this character and add one to it, right? And then you can say else, right? If it doesn't have the character, we're gonna to wanna to set the character, right, equal to occurrence of one, right? But we can actually compress this, right? Because we're what we're really doing is we're calling the same line of code. We're setting character equal to a new occurrence. So what we can do is just compress this, right? And we can just say, what's the new value gonna be? Right, if the map has a key for, if the map has an occurrence for this character or an entry, right, the, the value to start is gonna be, you know, getting the value at that key. Otherwise, it's gonna start at, at zero, right? And, you, and I know I'm saying zero and I'm saying one here, <clears throat> but that's because we're always gonna add one to it, right? Now we can delete both of these. Uh, if an else is right, we're gonna have those two statements we had earlier. Right, and so how do we compress it? Well, what we'll do is since we're adding one in this line, right, and we want to have one in this line, we can actually compress this into one by just saying value plus one, right? So when we don't have an entry, we'll get zero, add one to it, and we'll get one. When we do have a value, we'll just add one to it as normal. All right, but now I want to make sure, right, if the occurrences for the character, right, while the occurrences for the character is greater, then one, we have a problem, right? Because we have a repeating 
character, which is kind of what we didn't want for our substring. If that's the case, then what we can do, right, is we need to come, we need to actually implement this line. So occurrences for car is greater than one. What that means is if map dot get car is gr greater than one, then that's an issue, right? And so we want to pretty much decrement values, right, starting from the left hand side of the window, right, until we rectify that issue. So to do that, we can do is just say map uh, dot set s sub left equal to, and we're gonna have to do the same thing. We can say uh, car left is equal to s sub left, right? That way we can compress what's going on here. We'll say map.set the character at this index, right? We're gonna set it to the same thing we did earlier, but minus one, right? So we're gonna say car left, uh, is equal to map dot get car left minus one, right? And then we can do left plus equal one. So this makes sense so far. Map dot set map dot get. So let's try it. I think the uh, so it works on the first go, but. I think the time complexity here, right? We're doing a linear time iteration. Let's see if it works for all the cases. So it does work. I think what we're seeing here is that we're doing a linear time iteration over the string, but additionally, right, when we do run into a character that is uh, ha that does have a duplicate, right, we're going to iterate over the sh string starting from left, right? And at worst case, right, since this is not, we're not duplicating this logic, right? At worst case, right, this loop, right, this while loop runs over the entirety of the string twice. So our worst case time complexity would actually be 2n, right? Because left is just chasing after right, which means right can do one iteration over the string. So can left, so our worst case is 2n, which is n. Space-wise, we're using a map Right, and we're guaranteed that the input is going to be letters, digits, symbols, and spaces, which means that we can relatively guarantee constant space, right, since we can guarantee a constant set of keys. So that pretty cool. So I'll say, what can we improve on next time? We'll say goal time is O of and and space is also technically constant time. I mean, constant space as well. I wonder if there's a better solution to this problem. So you have about 10 minutes until we evaluate and we have coin change. There's no way we do coin change in 10 minutes. There's just no way we do coin change in 10 minutes. Hmm. Maybe we do coin change in 10 minutes. So maybe we just do coin change because I haven't read enough information to actually make a difference to evaluate division yet. There's no way we do coin change in 10 minutes. So I'm thinking maybe we can revisit coin change. No way we do, we could probably do coin change in 10 minutes because I think I understand the backtracking algorithm that can create, or I wouldn't say backtrack, we're just generating all possible paths and taking the shortest path, which takes a lot of time, right? But if we're looking for shortest path, there's definitely an algorithm we can use for that. Which is interesting. This is interesting. Let's try it anyway. Right. You're given an integer array coins representing coins of different denominations, and an integer amount representing a total amount of money. Return the fewest number of coins that you need to make up that amount. 
That amount of money cannot be made up by any combination of the coins return negative one. You may assume that you have an infinite number of each kind of coin. I think this is a dynamic programming. This sounds like knapsack a little bit. All right, return the fewest number of coins that you need to make up that amount. That amount of money cannot be made up by any combination of the coins return negative one. So input coins is equal to one, two, five, amount is equal to 11, right? So you have an integer array coins representing coins of different denominations, integer amount representing a total amount of money. You wanna return the fewest number of coins that you need to make up that amount. The output is three, you need three coins, right? Because the fewest number of coins you can use to make up 11 is five plus five plus one, which makes sense. Right, with this one we're given a coin two and there's no way for us to get to three with an infinite number of coins. So in that case we return negative one when there's no way to get to two, when there is no way to get to amount. Additionally, we have coins equal one, right? And we can get to an amount of zero, right? Just by using no coins. So just initially, right, we can say if amount equals zero, we can just use no coins basically to get to that amount. The coins length is never greater than 12, right? And coins can be anything from one to 32 bit integer minus one. And the amount is always equal to zero, 10 to the four. So our traditional way of doing this is a I think it's a, I was told it's a backtracking algorithm. So it's a backtracking algorithm, right? With exponential time, right? We basically generate all paths and keep the shortest. And then you can optimize it, optimize by saving shortest paths for amounts, right? But it wasn't very great. It wasn't very fast either. So it wasn't very useful, but maybe there's a different way we can do this. Fewest number of coins that you need to make up that amount, right? So basically we have, well, we know that we can do it the backtracking way. Now, can we do it a, another way a way where you reuse, I didn't, I haven't read anything about dynamic programming yet, but we, could we reuse our solutions? Time complexity was exponential time. I think another problem, I think with the shortest path, I know there's a shortest path algorithm, which you could technically use uh, if you replace the coins, use the instead of using the coins as the vertices, we use the edges, right? The value of the coin to weight the edge. Then what we could phrase this as the shortest path problem, right? Where the shortest path is the path that costs the least. I mean, the shortest path is the path with the least number of nodes. The least number of nodes. That being said, we don't know how to implement that. So, hmm. Optimize by saving shortest paths for amounts. Is there a better way we can do this? This problem reminds me of climbing stairs. I guess, can we optimize what we wrote before? What was the problem? I think we wrote before, I guess I'm trying to see if there's a different way we can do it. DP, one, two, five, amount is equal to 11. Three, 11 equals five plus five plus one. Coins equal to one. So I 
think there's I I want to do this in a different way than I usually do this because I usually do this problem in this really convoluted way that just barely passes that just barely passes uh that just barely passes time limit exceeded so if we have a simple problem here right we have c right we have c is equal to 1 3 and 5 right and amount is equal to 15 i believe nope it's actually equal what is this amount is actually equal to 11 so amount is equal to 11, right? So how do we make this make sense? The way I usually visualize this problem is that there are C graphs, right? There are C. Mm, kind of sucks that there's no simple undo button, right? But we have C graphs. And the reason we have C graphs, right, because there are three graphs possible, is one graph starting at one, another graph starting, and it's not actually three, I believe. I think the problem is one, two, five. So that's actually my bad. Right. Right, so we have one, two, five, so there's actually three graphs, right? There's one that starts at one, there's one that starts at two, and one that starts at five. And the reason there's this many is because at each point, what you can do is travel between any number of the coins because there's an infinite number of coins. So at one, right, you can actually go right down to one, right? And I think the problem with what I usually do, when I write then I draw this graph, I draw it as a with the nodes, I guess when I draw this tree, I draw it as the nodes with the actual coin instead of the actual value denomination. So it can be a little confusing. So I think maybe for this version, we'll try and do the opposite. Where instead of drawing the coin we use, we'll draw two, right? Because we're going up one, right? And there's another node here, right, that you can do, which is actually going to be three, right, because you're doing one plus the coin two, right, and there's another node all the way out here, if you do one plus five, you get six, right, and then each of these have their own subtrees, right, where you do one, and then from here, you, you could take, you know, the coin two, right, and you'd get four, and I just messed up again, I wrote one, this would actually be three. From here, you can take another coin, four. From here, you can take another coin, right, seven. And so it gets pretty convoluted pretty fast, right? So this gets pretty crazy pretty quickly, right? And I'm sure you could have a bunch going here. This would not be the shortest path. This would not be the shortest path. And this would not be the shortest path. Right? But even then you'd have a lot of revisiting of nodes, right? Because from here you can even take four, right? So we're revisiting the value four. Right, and then from here you also visit five. This graph is really convoluted. But either way, the shortest path, right? You actually, if you take one more five coin, right? A nickel, you end up at 11. So, This is how I usually model it, right? And I think there, there's three graphs because you can start at one, two, or five, right? And you have to explore all the three graphs, but you can reuse all the, the shortest paths. So it's ideally each different version would be, uh, each different version would be, each different version, uh, each iteration through the graph would actually be shorter right if we were memo memoize what we get maybe our best case scenario here is just to actually optimize the one we always write because there's no way 
the one we always write is, I mean, I guess on the first iteration, you still have to visit all possible points, which is why it's so slow. All possible paths to find the shortest one. And since it's depth first, there's really no heuristic to optimize. Since it's depth first, right? In this sense, we end up going all the way on this left-hand side of the graph, in the visiting one, all the way down to 13, which is a little bit silly. But either way, we end up visiting all possible paths, right? Just when we visit that first, when we go through that first subtree. Because it's depth first, we end up going all the way down left as we can, right? And that probably we'd end up at 11. Right, but this would actually be a path length of 11, which definitely isn't the answer they're looking for. But on the way to that, there's no way we actually didn't find the other path, right? Because Another thing I'm thinking we could possibly do to optimize this is to use sh is to stop when we is to stop when we are visiting stop when, when stop when we're visiting a for example by the time we get all the way down here to 11 right no it actually doesn't make any sense because you have to visit Every path, for every, it's just crazy actually with the number of coins. This solution is just very, very strange. I've, I'm actually thinking there's a different way to go about this to actually optimize this, right? Because if we think about it, right, we're aiming for something like, we're aiming to get to an amount in the shortest possible steps. So another way to optimize this algorithm would be to sort our coins in reverse order if we sorted our coins in reverse order we wouldn't visit we wouldn't take the time visiting this left hand subtree which takes so long when the shortest path lies basically what i'm saying is the way depth first search works we end up visiting our tree something like this right so we by the time we get to the right hand side right we've already wasted so much time if we were to sort our coins in reverse order, since we're hoping to get to a mountain as quick as possible, I think we'd actually get, we'd actually visit the right hand side first, right, which would give us a shortest path first. And since we're getting the shortest path first, right, once we get a path that reaches 11, we can save that. So I have something like three, which is our shortest path. That way, when we're visiting every other node in this tree, we'll say, hey, if our path length is ever greater, right, than our shortest path length, then just abandon this route. There's no way it can be useful. So I think it'll still be pretty slow. But I think it'll be much faster, right? I didn't think about sorting, so maybe we'll try that to optimize this, right? So the original, basically we're doing the original backtracking algorithm, an optimization to sort coins in and since our, our coins are only ever gonna we're only gonna have 12 coins is actually kind of in our favor a little bit we can sort coins in descending order right and hopefully this helps our backtracking algorithm so how our backtracking algorithm originally worked I believe right we want to start at coins sub one I'm going to start at the first coin right and then we're going to do a depth first search starting at each coin visiting all of our coins right so to do that, we're going to need a min, which we return, which is going to start at infinity, right? Presumably, if there's no way to get to our goal amount, we're going to return infinity, right? But if min equals infinity, it actually means there's no path to our goal amount. That's the case. Problem statement actually wants us to return negative one. So we can do that. Otherwise, we'll return infinity. And then here, what we can do is, like we said, we're going to do coins 
dot sort a comma b and then do b minus a to sort it in ascending order and do four const coin of coins All right we're actually going to do this we're going to say min is equal to the math dot min of min right or right the dfs of passing in coins right the goal amount right our current amount which is going to be coin our current path length which is going to be zero and i'm not sure if we need anything else to start we'll probably also need a visited set which is going to help us not a visit a, a, vis, a, a map right so we can memoize our solution i'm actually going to comment out sorting because i want to see if this actually helps so let's say function dfs we're going to take coins it's just going to be an array of numbers amount which is going to be a number cur which is going to be a number and path length which is going to be a number and we're actually going to return a number it's going to be a couple of cases right if cur equals amount right it means that somehow we've had a valid path and we got to the goal that we were looking for so we're going to say return path length right else if cur is greater than amount then it means this wasn't actually a valid path to cur, for example, if we get to nine, right, which we will in this graph, we're gonna eventually try adding five to it. Well, five is a waste of time. Adding nine to five is gonna give us 14, which is actually not 11. So we're going to want to return infinity for this path since it's just not a useful path, right? And then for each current value, we're gonna to wanna to say min is equal to infinity, right? And we're gonna to wanna to do it pretty much another search to of all of our neighbors which is going to be one two or five right say const coin of coins right and then we're going to return min right and then we're going to do very much what we did earlier we'll say math dot min of min and dfs of coins right amount and cur right which cur is actually going to be cur plus coin right and our new path length we're going to add one to it right and so i think this actually could give us an answer to start but we'll test it so we actually get two i guess technically our number of coins we're going to start at one i think because if we start with a coin we're going to our path right is going to start minus one so let's see if this we're probably going to get time limit exceeded which is fine but i'd like to get time limit exceeded which technically means we pass most of the cases in the sense that all the obvious small cases we're okay with so this is perfect our time limit has exceeded right so then we can do what we said earlier right we can sort it but I'm pretty sure this sort is only going to matter right first once we um, sort is only going to matter uh, once we actually implement the memoization. But I'm curious to see right if it helps a little bit. Actually, I wish I had to visit the whole graph anyway, so we'll still get TLE, I just realized. So I think the other thing, I actually don't know if we need the memoization yet. The other thing I wanted to note is that we want one, another thing as well called min, best min, right? And the most the part that I, we want to work with best min is if I will right, have one more il, else if right if best min is greater than no if path length is greater than or equal to best min then this path is a waste of time since we can't do any better since we're minimizing our path so we'll just return infinity there's no point in going any further all right so then we're just gonna have to add best min to all of these things right so 
So our best min, I think the problem with it's hard to know what our best min is at all times. Or if we had some sort of like object that could persist this, but values don't really work. Uh, primitives don't really aren't really used by reference in JavaScript. So if we pass in min here, what we're really saying is that once we calculate a tree once, the next tree is not worth visiting. I mean, if if we can now shorten our iterations to the remaining graphs, the remaining trees, I guess the remaining graphs. We want a version though that allows us to basically stop wasting time. Best min so far. Right, if we pass it in here, down here, we really only skip. We need to wait for the value to be alive. Right, and the only way I can think of that is with some sort of object. This is crazy, but what if we try it anyway, right? What if we try this anyway? Actually, I'm realizing Thomas's comment earlier mentioned that coin chains is intuitively a BFS problem. This is true, because visiting all the way down to the deepest node to start is technically a waste of time. What we want is a way to sort of not waste iterations. If we have a very particularly large implicit graph, meaning that we're building the graph as we go, which we are, visiting each, every single node with a depth first search might be a waste of time now that I'm thinking about it. Presumably, if we're looking for the shortest path, then this would actually be fastest found with a breadth first search. So if we actually don't memoize this and change this to a breadth first search, does this make more sense? Right, and with the breadth first search, we typically use a queue, right? The node to start, right? Where you can actually just honestly uh, spread the whole coins array into this queue, right? And then we'll say while queue dot length. I mean, while queue dot length does not equal zero, right? Then we want to do some work. Right, we'd want to get a node, but it's actually going to be a coin. Right, but we want to keep track of our path length. I guess in, in a way, the path length is technically going to be the level. So maybe what we want to keep track is really just the level. Right, and once we actually, now I'm realizing if we're Interesting. Interesting. So maybe what we want to do is not just spread coins into this thing. We want to keep track of the path length. Right. But I don't know if the path length is, is the path length always going to be the same as the level? 
is that a good observation? Is the path length always going to be the same as the level? Basically looking for the level. I guess you could rephrase this problem as the level, finding the earliest level with node with a node equaling 11. Find the, find the level with the node equaling 11. We have to be able to count the level. Have to be able to count the level. Right, so basically we need a way to count the level. So our initial level is definitely going to look like, we can say const initial, it will look equal to coins dot map C, right? And we're gonna have is an array of tuples where we have the coin and the starting level, which is going to be zero, or I guess one. All right, we'll push into here will actually be initial and the delimiter will be null. And we'll say const coin is equal to q dot shift, right? If coin, right? Then we know we have an actual coin. Otherwise, you know, we have a delimiter, right? And then we can say let level equals zero, right? And at the end, we'll just add one to level Right, so if a coin, if the coin exists, right, then the nodes that we want to push, right, to visit the remaining like level would actually just be uh, for const and I guess neighbor uh, coins, right? And I think we can, yeah, for const neighbor of coins, we can do is just do q dot push and I'm not sure because we only took coin right but this is actually a tuple say coin and uh, just call it path length which is really just the level as we can call L or we can call it coin level right what we'll do is we'll say Q dot push right Doing a breadth first search. We're going to do Q dot push coin plus cur. I guess I'm getting I'm getting all over the place, right? Our end case would be right if coin if coin equals amount, and we would just return a level. Right. Otherwise, we want to keep going. We'll say for const neighbor of coins, we're going to want to push the current coins value right plus, uh, right the current coins value right and neighbor right, and the tuple is going to be uh, coin level plus one. I guess what we want to return isn't coin isn't level but coin level. I, I think we're duplicating information. If we're on a level, right, then we know the level that we're on based on a delimiter, right, with the null here. So we actually don't need coin level. And we can actually just spread coins into here, right? We'll have a coin. We don't need coin level. We'll have level equals zero and we'll return level, right, when we when we find a coin equals amount, right? Then we push something onto the array. It's not going to be an array of tuples. We're just going to push coin plus neighbor, right? Otherwise, otherwise, right, it means we have null, right? If we have null, 
right? That means we have to do level plus equal one because we know we just found the end of a level, right? And the other thing we're going to want to do, right? If Q dot length does not equal zero, it means that we have another new level loaded to process. So we're going to do Q dot push null, right? To make sure we process that or we make sure we add an end to that level, right? And instead of returning I think down here, what we can do is actually just return negative one, right? If we never find a coin equals amount. Let's check if it works for our starting case. So we actually end up returning negative one. So that's kind of strange. Yeah, that is strange. We say if coin. So to start coin should have one, two, and five in it, right? We'll pull off one, right? One does exist, right? One does not equal 11, right? So we do, we push on, right? Q dot push coin plus neighbor, right? And then we push on two, three, and six, right? And then we go to the next one, we go to two, right? Two does not equal 11, so you push on Right, so I'm actually curious, why are we getting negative one? Presumably, right, if we get to five, we'll say coin, we'll say coin plus neighbor, right, we'll get to 10 eventually, we'll say coin plus neighbor, we'll push on 11, right, we'll push on Oh my God, Q dot length does not equal zero. Right, I forgot we we're gonna add one to the level, right? So if that's the case, The last exceeded input. Oh, right. The other thing is we don't want to push right. So I'm realizing now we're pushing on coins that are a waste of time as well, right? The other thing we want to do right is if, let's just say new coin is equal to coin plus neighbor, right? If new coin is greater than amount, right? Don't push it. So basically we only want to do it. We only want to push a coin on if new coin is less than or equal to amount. So I see that's why our last executed input two and three is running infinitely. So Ah, TLE still. That is unfortunate. That is interesting, though. I guess, yeah, it does technically get pretty large. In another sense, right, we could still do what we did, what we meant to do earlier, right? And so if we sort this, right, this example. 
I'm sure we'll actually we get, might get to the answer faster. Maybe not though. It's still the same number. I think we just made the same mistake twice. For a particular kind of graph, this does help, but it's still TLE. So I think the other thing we want to do So we'd have one, two, and five. We have something like this, basically. We have one, two, five. We're doing a breadth first search, right? So we have these nodes, right? Then these nodes, and then these nodes, right? And then for this one, Right, we push these nodes onto the key. So it's basically like this. Right, so it's going really, really, really fast. Right, and then each of these gets six children. So it's actually a little bit crazy now that I think about it. Optimization. So I actually thought we had hit a cheat code with this breadth first search here. More work to be done. It's actually, oh, I guess you can't, can't I don't even know if you can memoize this version. At least with the depth first search, you can memoize the answer since you really search to the end. Mm. different ways to add them. Gotta be, yeah, I think D, maybe DFS is the best we can actually do here. It's the only way you can actually optimize your output. I'm wondering maybe we could do one more thing or we don't visit coins we've seen already because there's no point. Create a new set of numbers. And scene, right, does not have coin, right? Then we'll say scene.add coin. We'd also need the same thing, less than and, right? Scene does not have new coin. Then we'll push it on. 
blue seam dot add. Actually, we don't have to since if we push it onto the queue, then it should be added when we get to it. But I think we might want to add it now, actually. So I think if we go back to our original test case just to test this. Oh, I'm also realizing, right, if we add it here, right, then that's actually a problem, right, because then we actually have already seen it by the time we pop it off the queue. The only path of size six is five ones and or right. We actually can't do scene. Because the path that we got for a particular node may not be, if we visit five, right, there's multiple paths from five, so we can't just say because we've seen five, right, we don't want to visit it again. Hmm. Yes, we'll have to return to coin change tomorrow. We'll do more reading on graphs. I'm sure there's a way to optimize this, but that is the end of day 50.